this is a stage. A stage for ideas. My idea is dramatic pause. The idea that food is art. Not the art of putting food on a plate, but the art of flavor. First, a little backstory. People always ask me what kind of chef I am. Now, I'm not a southern chef. I'm not an Italian chef. I'm not an Asian chef. Even at the beginning of my journey, I reluctantly took the title of chef. A chef is an earned title, and I was just a kid. Now, I like to think of myself as a flavorist. Let me show you why. I make menus, which boils down to dishes, which boils down to bites. To understand how I make the perfect bite, you must first understand that food is art, that flavor is art, and I combine them to create a masterpiece. Now, this masterpiece is art. Art that envelops every sense. Flavors for your taste, aroma for your smell, crunch for your hearing, even the feel on the fork or the texture of a sandwich for your sense of touch. And of course, plating for your eyes. No other art form fully immerses your senses like food. No orchestra, no Mona Lisa, no perfume. No other experience is like food. But in that same sense, everything is like food. I'm going to use painting as my example today. How one perfect bite is a masterpiece. Here's how I paint with flavor. Now, first, I start with the base flavor. It's tuna. Now, what does tuna look like? To me, it looks like this. Now, but, but wait, why, why is it blue? Why, why isn't it pink? To me, tuna tastes like the blue, like the sea, like uh, kind of where it lived, where its memories were. It doesn't taste pink like the color of the flesh. It tastes like the sea, like little bits of seaweed and grits of sand. It tastes like a blue, like a Pacific blue. And it's also soft and ripply in its texture. When you tear it, it tears along lines. It has a soft, fatty feel. That's the texture of the tuna. Now, in my painting, this is the first color and texture, the base. Now, second, I season it. This gives it flavor, uh, definition, highlights, lowlights. And you know, it does the same for art. This step is quite crucial. Without seasoning, you have a flat painting, a flat dish. I'm sure you can remember a moment when Emil lacked salt and pepper. You know, seasoning after is like a Band-Aid. Seasoning before is like not getting injured in the first place. <laughs> now, third, I sear it. Cooking at its simplest is fire. And searing the tuna gives it um, more crunch, defines the ripples, and gives it a seared aspect. Yeah, there, there it is. In art, it's a uh, brown and gray fade from the top and bottom. Searing the sides would further toughen the fish and hide more blue. Now fourth, fourth I add carrot. Now carrots taste orange. They're just orange. Now they're the earthy crisp side of orange. They're the orange of the earth. Now the carrot is also slashy. It takes its moment and then carries through the dish. Now carrots aren't brown. They don't taste brown, even though they're earthy and deep. They're still orange. In art, they're just some orange slashes that are a direct contrast to the blue base. Now fifth, I add an apple gastrique. Now this is a sweet, tangy, appley drizzle that contrasts the richness of the seared tuna. Now it has a fruity tanginess that a lot of other ingredients will tie back into with both contrast and similarity. Now for the painting, it is this drizzle of a warm golden color. You know, it just, it's just beautiful. Sixth, I add a dot of hot sauce. Now, this opens up the flower of flavors I've already made, and it causes them to blossom into their full potential. Now, it may be just a red dot, but you know, you can really see the spice in the way it's thrown onto the canvas. Next, I add my Napa cabbage. Now, Napa cabbage is just like the carrot. It isn't pretending to be something it's not. It's just this curly, fluffy green. It's kind of crispy. And you know, it's a color that every dish needs to be appetizing. You have to have green. And uh, in art, you know, it's just kind of a curly green, you know? Next, I had a game changer. Almost like a mercenary. A pre-developed, 
deep flavor. I had sesame oil. Now, sesame oil is just incredible. It makes the tuna richer. It makes the carrot earthier. It changes every flavor in the dish. I mean, it is just magical in the depth it gives to everything else. Now, the only way to illustrate this in art is with a sepia, or in this case, a black outline. Since it does so much to the flavor profile that no other element could justly interpret its intricacy and intensity. You know what I mean? Totally game changer here. Turned it from like Asian fusion into like, huh, sci-fi maybe? I don't know. <laughs> Nine, I add cream cheese. Now this is totally different from the entire theme so far. I, it has this creaminess, this pillowiness, and it's completely opposite, you know? I don't have anything creamy on there. Now, you might ask me, how is the tang addressed? Well, the gastrique is tangy, so how is the cream cheese also tangy? I mean, don't you get too much tang? Well, it just kind of loses it. It only gives an airiness and a creamy mouthfeel, nothing else. Now, in art, <laughs> it's this kind of cloud and slight haze. Um, it's supposed to cover some of the stronger, more explosive elements and drags the blue back into being relevant. What do you think about this slide? What do you, what do you think this is? Is it, is it salt and pepper? D does that mean I'm done? Do you think it's done? I always ask myself for the last few steps, is it done? Have I gone too far? Well, they're actually black and white sesame seeds, not salt and pepper. <laughs> and uh, you know, they just kind of add a little bit of crunch and some interesting kind of coolness, I mean. Next, I add a single squiggle of fried ramen. Now, the cool thing about the fried ramen is that it has no flavor. Every other element I've added has had lots of flavor. Flavors that have changed and evolved with each addition. But adding an ingredient that has no flavor provides a break from the swirling storm I've created. Now in art, I illustrate this with an outline of a squiggle, since it is void of all flavor and is just for look and uh, a little bit of crunch. Now, we're at the 12th step here, guys. Um, Twelfth, I add basil air. It's an aroma that tricks your mind into believing there is basil in a dish, when in fact, there's only a smell, no other sense. Oh, and it's Thai basil, which has a sharper, darker aroma than normal basil. Now, for art, this is a, a burst of pyramids that are like broken glass. They break up the already finished artwork, and uh, they add that little, that little thing at the end, you know? And uh, that's it. That, that's, my, that's my finished masterpiece there. Now, here's the dish in food. Now, now let's show them side by side here. Now, if, if you look at it, some of the strongest, most pronounced elements in the painting are hardly even visible on the bite. I mean, can you, can you even see the dot of hot sauce? I mean, it's kind of blended in with the uh, gastrique there. And I mean, the basil air is just the little, the little circle right there. So that's kind of really cool. And uh, now, when I took the stage, I'm sure you were expecting me to talk about food. And not solutions to climate change or tech innovations or, I don't know, the importance of classical literature in a world of 140 characters. But did you expect to see the world of food through my eyes? Did you expect to see how I paint with flavor? How I'm an artist with an ever-changing style? I'm a chef with an ever-changing cuisine. I hope that when you eat your next meal, you think about it a little bit differently. That you question a dish, not on ingredients or words, but on the painting it portrays. Bon appetit. Thank you.